Yeah. Right down the hill here, they used to have a, a little cage with the beehive. Yeah, yeah. You know all about it? You know what they called it? Beehive. Yeah. It's still there. And uh, no, I don't think so. <clears throat> um, I think I gave us a uh, more break than we were supposed to have uh, according to the schedule. So <laughs> forget it for, next, uh, for the next few days. <laughs> okay. So Andrew, please. Okay. First of all, I, I'm not doing PowerPoint. I never do it. I hate it. Uh, so that's just for as atmospherics, basically. You can just look at the text and enjoy the uh, woodblock printing. Although further down, I'm going to scroll down later, and there's something you might like to look at. And what, at the very end, a particular Chinese text, which I want to go over with you. So everyone starts with the uh, phrase grammar wars. And in the case of classical Chinese literature, uh, both of these terms, well, Chinese uh, intellectual literary history, both of these terms are, are problematic. Excuse uh, me, could you possibly speak louder? Uh, uh, I've been known, I've been often uh, castigated for that, but uh, I'll try. Um, so, wars over, over literary linguistic issues. I can't think of any good example, so I, 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 I try very hard to think of it. Uh, but uh, serious controversies, very heated controversies, yes. Uh, not really about grammar, because that's the really problematic word here. We'll get to that in one second. Uh, but uh, much later in Chinese history, we get to the beginning of the 20th century, and there's this seismic shift from classical language to vernacular language. Uh, very heated discussions and, uh, and very, very serious controversies. Yes, is that. And all through Chinese history, there's been often uh, very uh, acrimonious uh, opposition on things like ancient and modern style. It's, it's always the Han Dynasty, who won, who won. And, uh, and much later, beginning in the uh, in the late Tang Dynasty and all the way through, late, through the Ming, Ming Dynasty, uh, ideas of restoring ancient style or opposing that. So there have been these, these kind of uh, controversies all along. But is it really about grammar? That's the question. Now, that raises the, the whole can of worms of uh, what do we mean? Or is there, is, can we speak about grammar in a language which doesn't have the grammatical markers which we usually think of when we use that term. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes this kind of idea is stated in such bold terms that it gets, gets almost uh, ludicrous. Uh, uh, observers, you know, non sinological observers of traditional Chinese civilization often come out with these sweeping statements like, China had no science. Or China has no religion, or the worst of all, when Hegel says China has no history. <laughs> you know, early in my acad academic career, I gave a public lecture. I thought it was brilliant. And I finished, and a hand went up, an old gentleman with a very strong German accent and said, Yes, very interesting, but we all know China has no history. <laughs> now, he got that from Hegel, and Hegel said it. Hegel had a point to make. I won't take the time to, to do it, but it's a stupid point. It's a point based on ignorance, but it's not stupid. Let's put it that way. Uh, just, uh, now back, to, so to say China has no grammar, even one of the most erudite scholars of Pesco Chinese that I know in the world, which is right over there, when I mentioned this to her yesterday, sort of half, half seriously, said, can we even talk about grammar in Chinese? This is such a thing. I'm misrepresenting you probably. Uh, <laughs> of course, it totally depends on which, what we mean by the term. If we mean the kind of stuff that fills grammar books, you know, a set of rules and, and analytic principles and uh, conceptual categories, 
uh, often presented in numerical sequences. You know, you learn rule one, three, five, and then four, six, seven, especially into the Sanskrit. Uh, uh, but in all, all the grammar learning books, if that's what we mean, then Chinese, you don't have that in Chinese, just because the, the fact of it being essentially classical Chinese is very important to, to make it clear. Uh, that the essential lexical units are monosyllabic without inflection. Some exceptions, we talk, but that's not doesn't it doesn't undermine the basic point that that's that's the nature of the language. So all this stuff you have in grammar books are not there. So you can say China has no grammar. But of course, if you mean by grammar, much much more profound idea that the essential uh, intrinsic structure which makes communication possible in a, in a, in a speech community. Of course, that's, that's what language means. So uh, between absolutely not, absolutely yes, where are we? <clears throat> um, let me just add a few more points to, 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 to that historical view before we go into what I really want to talk about. Uh, it's not that there was no science or uh, or uh, discipline of linguistics in early China from an early, very early time. Uh, but it's more, it's concentrated in things like philology, because that's a very loose term, can mean anything you want, uh, etymology, script, and especially phonetics, very sophisticated uh, work in these fields from, from very early times all the way through. But not about grammar because that would mean talking about things that that, that you don't observe that are, that aren't there at least apparently not there. But to see, I'm going to see we're going to see some examples in which um, people try to argue that that's not 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 in fact the case. Um, within this long tradition of linguistics in China, or you know, scholarly attention to language in throughout. Chinese intellectual history. Uh, the real story we can talk about begins with the advent of Buddhism in Han Dynasty, or especially first, second, third, fourth century CE, uh, when uh, had Indian monks coming to, or prop propagators of the faith coming to China, but more important, Chinese Buddhist scholars, monks in particular, going to India and staying there for long periods of time, becoming immersed in learning, mastering Sanskrit or the other languages of Buddhism. But, it, but, but I'm talking about Sanskrit now. So the other, you know, the first practice and Pali and all of that, is, I'm not talking about that, but it might, it might also fit. Um, and also becoming immersed in just the entire range of Indian thought and uh, Indian philosophy. And, uh, among these people, the first name I want to mention, he's not one of those uh, Buddhist monk scholars, but in the, uh, in his, the fifth century, uh, one, of, one of the most brilliant scholars of the time, a man named Shen Yu, who was, he, he was the chief editor, maybe even author of one of the great dynastic histories. And he was also a, a very important uh, political figure, uh, poet, but he also started paying attention to having a heightened uh, sensitivity to how Chinese works and talking about the tonal system in a very analytic way, even producing a kind of um, tabulate, tab, that's not the right word, but a, a systematic presentation of the Chinese tones and the various patterns, good and bad, that, that appear when, when in, 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 uh, in actual presentation, in actual uses in poetry. Um, but the real beginning of this heightened um, uh, comparative consciousness of Chinese and Sanskrit really probably begin, we start talking about it. it didn't begin then, but we start talking about it in the Tang Dynasty, especially seventh century onward. And we have this name, which everyone in Chinese studies knows, uh, a great monk scholar named Xuanzang, exists is a Buddhist name. His, his, actual name, nobody even knows anymore. Yeah, I can tell you what it is, but it's, it's never mentioned. Um, tell us. <laughs> Chinese, does that mean anything to you? Most most Chinese people wouldn't recognize that name. 
Anyway, uh, he went to China, to India, spent a long time there. And uh, well, first of all, this, he, is, he, is, he has become a figure in popular folklore and mythology and a subject of many, many uh, popular narratives. The, the most famous one being the so-called journey to the West, which many, many, many of you know. Uh, but he's not just a popular figure. He's an incredible scholar who translated many of the many of the Indian texts, wrote his own, uh, maybe derivative based on Indian sources, but still uh, most profound works of Buddhist philosophy in all of the Chinese languages. The book called uh, Chang Wei Shi Lun. Uh, sometimes it's called, how do you call it? Perfect, perfection of mind, of consciousness only philosophy, something like that. Which, uh, it's a very difficult book to read and understand. I, I, I had seminars with it uh, a few times and you know, struggle with every line, but it, it's, it's, it's an incredible work. So as a philosopher, as a, as a scholar, as a translator, and in many of his writings uh, about uh, translating and talking about specific Indian texts, he shows very sharp consciousness of the difference between the two linguistic systems, very much aware of it. And uh, inventing even, uh, or let's say, inventing is the wrong word, uh, devising uh, ways to talk about it in Chinese. And many of you know, it, when you have foreign words to be represented in Chinese, you can either translate them or transcribe them in a syllabic tra transcription. Uh, when he talks about um, uh, the very idea of grammar in Sanskrit, uh, I don't know if you, if you people will tell me this is a general term, but uh, via karana. Is that like a general term or it's a specific aspect? Anyway, he, he gets spelled out in a, a string of characters, which sounds like via uh, uh, karana. Uh, you can sort of get it. And sometimes that's shortened to figa uh, law, really bija law, but the bija is ka. As you know from your native language, native dialect. Uh, uh, and sometimes he, he, he uses another, he translates it into, into semantic words called Xiong Ming Ji Lun, meaning uh, uh, the last word means like discourse, but discourse means like the systematic presentation of meaningful utterances, something <coughs> like that. So it's very, very clear consciousness of, 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 of this object of contemplation and study, and also practically trying to present it in Chinese. Now, uh, it was Shanzai himself, but then this, 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 this obsession gets passed on to his disciples and immediate generations of disciples, and then going on and on and on, who, who picked this up and continue to you know, highly learned Buddhist uh, uh, individuals in China and also later in Japan. Uh, you know, just plain old monks uh, don't necessarily, they recite uh, uh, Buddhist scripture syllable by syllable without really understanding a word of it. But the scholars, yes, was in some very special cases. And that's what I wanna, wanna talk about here. <laughs> And I'm going to focus on two particular aspects of grammar, of Sanskrit grammar, which, um, well, I'm going to backtrack one sentence. Uh, if we start from the, the presumption, or at least the, uh, the the fear that none of this is going to work in Chinese, so it's, it's all just a sterile, a sterile futile exercise. Uh, or apologetics, why we don't have this stuff that the Indians have in their language, uh, then it doesn't really lead any place. But there's a few examples, aspects of Sanskrit gra grammar, they were grammatical aspects, which uh, do make sense, uh, at least if we look at it more carefully, maybe not at first sight. One of these is, uh, well, it, it is essentially samasa, uh, do you have a conventional way to explain that? Then compound, compound. noun-based noun compounds. Is that good enough? What, what do you say in class? Uh, nominal, uh, nominal compounds. Just simply yeah. that, uh, even though they're not always noun-noun. 
Okay. Right. So uh, those of you, half the people here know Sanskrit a thousand times better than me. Some don't. Uh, in, in Sanskrit studies, which I imbibed in a half-baked way sitting in David Schulman's classes for many years, uh, there's a typology of them. They're not all the same thing. It's not just noun, noun, which in English, when you say a noun compound, that's sort of what you mean. But it could be, um, you know, attributive word plus noun, or even verb plus noun, or even some other thing plus noun. Which for, and there's a whole well-established typology of these with very specific names we're going to look at in a second, um, uh, uh, which puts it into the grammar books. Otherwise, you would need grammar about it. You say it's a noun compound. So what? As in basically every language, this is not a special feature of Sanskrit. Almost every language that I know uh, has the same phenomenon, compounds, noun-based compounds. Uh, certainly your, the European languages and the Semitic languages, and uh, you keep going. Uh, the question is, is it just something that happens or something that becomes a consciously crafted and, 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 and then analyzed, classically analyzed feature of a linguistic system as it is in, as it is in Sanskrit. So to say there are noun compounds in Chinese, or that there's Nihut in Hebrew and these other th things in other languages, that doesn't mean anything. That's just meaningless. But to look at it as, as trying to look more carefully at how these things are really working uh, semantically, lexically, or just I mean, instead of saying semantically, I'm going to say in terms of what they really mean, in, uh, in <clears throat> whether that whether this system developed in Sanskrit can work in other languages too. And that's one of the things these, these, these scholarly writings I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention in a second uh, are trying to do. So one of the first subject I wanna look at is Samasa. The second is cases, case endings. And here again, at first sight, this would be a non-issue, a non-starter. It's not there in Chinese, so how can you talk about it? But then we see, I'm gonna show you an example, uh, where uh, this, is, this is one text which does it. That's an 18th century Japanese uh, uh, or um, scholarly writing in classical Chinese by a Japanese monk and his disciples uh, from the 18th century, much later, um, who, who do look at this and say, yes, we do have something like that, even though it's not there in the form we expect it to be. Uh, if you look for it according to what we think, uh, uh, case declension is going to be, it's just not there. Uh, but yes, it is there in another way. Uh, and and I'll, I'll come to that uh, after talking a little bit about Samas. Um, so after Shenzhen, uh, the next generation, uh, Shenzhen's dates, if, if you really want to know, uh, 602, I think, to 680 something, 670 something. And it is, he has a disciple named Kuei Ji, 632 to 682, you know, it's all within seventh, seventh century, who gets to his specific descriptive points uh, from a, a broader perspective of, of knowledge of the linguistic system of, of Sanskrit and using a lot of the key terms. For example, he distinguishes between uh, I'm going to say it the way I think it is, and you correct me, my Sanskrit friends, somanta and tinanta. So somanta, what it, the literal meaning of the word, he spells it out in Chinese, uh, sumanta and uh, di, di nan, it's yen, but na, di, uh, di, di, di nan, it's do, but da, di nan, di nan, di nan ta. Uh, somanta, in his a presentation of it has more to do with substantives, not only nouns, also substantives, verbal substantives, but substantives. I don't know if this is right or wrong according to uh, what it should be in Sanskrit. And tinata is more like more elaborate uh, elaborations, often verbal, based on, uh, you know, and the whole term tinata, it's, it's very, very cute. Uh, uh, 
and you know it comes from a panini a little a little tricky thing in panini where teen is the first half of one of a of one word and the second half of another word ends up being teen and then making that into an abstract noun covering this this whole thing. am i saying it right uh, not exactly but okay. it's close <laughs> enough <laughs> well that's what they thought it meant anyway yeah. <laughs> okay now so it, it gets, it's not first start talking about samasa. Um, do I have this up on the screen here? I think I do. How do I make this bigger? Where do I do it? Go to the plus sign. Plus sign? I don't see it. So you want to make you want to I'm the last person to yeah. <laughs> You're trying to figure out figure them out, but yeah. well, this is, no, this is going back to cases. Uh, do I I think do I have this here too? I think maybe. Uh, maybe in the previous page. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I see I don't have it here. I'll just have to, I can present it to you. So the 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 set of Usually, uh, total number six or seven or eight, I'm not sure, of, of, of some other categories uh, have these um, sort of fanciful metaphoric uh, names in Sanskrit, like Hatturusha and uh, Bahurihi. And you can, my friends can, can give the exact uh, derivation of these things, uh, uh, having to do with. Uh, Categories in which uh, a noun modifies a noun, or a uh, uh, the first element is considered to be possessed by the second element, or to be a, a defining feature of the second element, and uh, things like that. Uh, I'm not the one to, to to explain that to you. But what's interesting here is the way these categories are named and therefore explained in Chinese. Uh, like um, um, uh, I'm not, I can't even match them up properly, but uh, I think this is Tatrusha, which, which in Chinese means, no, this is, this is Kama Dharya, uh, bearing, kar, uh, Karma Dharya, bearing the, and Karma doesn't really mean anything like you think Karma means, it means like the, some substantive thing, right? Some concrete, mm -hmm. phenomenal thing, object of <coughs> contemplation. So, and Chinese is uh, 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 explanation. The, the third term is what's used for all these categories. Literally means interpretation, but here it means like a version, something like that. And well, here it's like literally from the Sanskrit, bearing the karma. Right, and this word for karma in Chinese, as in Indian too, Indian languages from the root which has it just simply means doing something. But the idea of not simply an act or a deed, but in this sense, a substantive it can be a noun or, or 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 a verb, some some concrete phenomenal thing. So this example is called in Chinese bearing that. Because that's the same. That's the same as in the in the um, in the, in the, in the Sanskrit name. Tatrusha is itu. It's not here. Yeah, that's not that's something else. It's not, it's not here, right? Yeah, that's something else. Uh, means depending on the primary term. So means if you won't find it, you won't find it from uh, I forgot to to, to copy it. Uh, Zhu is half of a of a of a paired concept of host and guest, in which host means more the subjective or the primary thing, and guest the secondary thing. So yi zhu, something which is dependent upon or in a dependent relationship with the second one. Does that work work for Tap Uh I'm just showing out what what these terms that, that were developed by these monk scholars. Uh, I'm not, I, I can't, 
make the exact uh, correspondence. Bahurihi, Idrihi, uh, how would you explain that? Two terms which, what, what's the relationship called Bahurihi? Somebody who has rice is what it means. Yeah, that's the, that's the literal meaning. So what does that mean? So it's an exocentric compound in the sense that it's not the actual uh, material objects that are being described, but the person or the entity the sun, that has them. It's yeah, like saying some uh, attribute. Some the noun with its attribute. It, it's exocentric. It's like Blackbeard in English. Right? Blackbeard is a person who has a black. Yeah, but well, it doesn't work only on the. Well, not yeah. Blackbeard is not a good example of that. That's something else. What is it? That's not the beard doesn't have the blackness in that example. The person. Yeah. The person. Yeah. So you need you need another beard. noun there. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, but in Chinese, that's just we called having. The, the quality, okay, good enough. Uh, and then it goes on to the other three, which um, are, are less important. Uh, what's important here is not simply setting up the typology, but how they apply it. And in, <clears throat> in uh, these texts, like that's one example of it, but I'm gonna look, go back to that for, for a different reason. Um, it takes sort of, sort of very common phrases like the phrase for enlightened one. Uh, there's two Chinese phrases which are a double noun, or double nominal, not really nouns, thing. Jiejo, the enlightened one, the one who is woken up, not, not woke. Uh, uh, and then say, is it, is it What's the relationship between the person who has this thing, has had this experience, and uh, what kind of samasa is that talking about? And another one uh, is a Chinese uh, Buddhist expression, yi shi, so like uh, consciousness, and well, let's use consciousness for the second one, uh, thought and consciousness. And the question is, are these, is it a compound in which the two things are more or less synonymous? Or is it A of B or B of A or B in the circumstances of A or the all this? And there's a very long, interesting discussion of that. Also, I'm going to just mention something without going into it. The same discussion of the Samasa starts to uh, lead us into very abstract territory having to do with Buddhist philosophy about, uh, well, give it Aristotelian terms. Uh, uh, accident and uh, what's the opposite of accident? Essence and accident, or you know, uh, 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 substance and uh, function, or uh, self contained or self existent things versus things dependent on phenomenal change, things which are really part of the, the philosophy underlying these people's scholastic games. <clears throat> So I'll come back to that uh, later with another with more focused uh, discussion. Also, one more additional point here is that, now I'll get to this in a second. So now let's go get to the second idea of, of case, which at first sight seems to be uh, really uh, just a little me mechanical manipulation uh, apologetically trying to say, oh, language is not so bad. We have stuff like that, just like the, like the Indians have. But no, there's more to it. But what they really, what's really presented here, I, mean, I think this, you know, this, yeah, you see that. It's going through the list of uh, uh, case, this is in the Sanskrit order. It's the one that I've, I'm, I'm familiar with. And uh, <clears throat> in each case saying we have that, but what they have, is always prefixing a preposition to the noun. Uh, nominative is different, but so dative is two or four, the noun. And it's set it through the list and of oh, the noun, possessive. Um, now, at first sight, it seems like they're just, they're just uh, trying to play a little game, but once we think about it, that's what all so many languages do. How does English do it? How do French and German do it, except it's for their residual possessors? Uh, 
how does Hebrew do it? Well, Hebrew is slightly different because you can also have the the, the, the declined personal pronoun, which is in a, a way of, of getting around that. Arabic has the uh, minimal uh, three cases of, but but they're sort of tacked on at the end. It's not really the same thing as as uh, as declining the actual word, which we which which we have in Sanskrit and, and Latin and Greek. <clears throat> so uh, exp expressing case by uh, by combining preposition or in many cases postposition, like in Japanese and I'll take languages and Turkish and many other languages, uh, affixing an extra word as opposed to incorporating it, embedding it in the word itself. And when I get to the end of my little presentation here, I'm going to ask the question, does it matter which way you do it? Uh, you can start thinking about that. I'll, I'll try and coax the question a little bit better when I get to that. <clears throat> um, before I go on, I want to present a Sanskrit term which I totally don't understand, but we can get I can get some help. Karaka. What does that cover? That is a very complicated. <laughs> we cannot answer it <laughs> because these are these are supposedly uh, Chinese presentation of of that. Yeah, these terms karta and karma. No, they, they, those are those are kinds of karma. So bri briefly, karakas <laughs> are the abstract notions of the relationship between agency and an action that underline most but not all of the graphic or the, the formal or the the the, the, the declines of the vibhaktis okay but not the genitive usually because the genitive is the relationship between nouns and not the relationship between an agent or a, a, an action substance right so so why isn't that just a more fancy more more uh, mystifying way of saying talking about cases it's about not what? about cases it's an abstract discussion about right but it take, but in in lots of concrete linguistic context, uh, environments it takes the form of cases but it depends upon if, if you have an active sentence the nominative case indicates the agent if you have a passive sentence it indicates the patient or the object and so uh, Sanskrit idea is that in the Sanskrit system, the cases are simply numbered. And then you have to have rules that tell you under what circumstances the agent is represented by number one rather than number three, three yeah. the instrumental. Yeah. That's why there are two, two parallel things. So even though- Whereas the, one is morphological and one is semantic. Even, even though <coughs> these, these, these texts I'm, I'm looking at don't really make much of this word karaka, although it does come up uh, in in this phonetic translation, trans transcription, which doesn't uh, mean very much. Uh, but now go back to this. This is uh, somebody's presentation of what's in that Chinese text that I, I, I flashed up there at the beginning. So let's see, look at the kind of things it talks about. First of all, nominative is the the the, the general term for all these cases is just sound. It means sound pattern or something, sound uh, variation. So you can see why it's used. Uh, so the first word that she is the, and, and it, it's given that a Japanese uh, presentation because this is from a Japanese version of this much later. Um, uh, just the basic substance of it, the T of it. Okay, literally body of it. Uh, but look at the kind of things it starts to talk about. What is worldly? And the rest of it, just look at it, uh, you can read it yourself. Uh, it's sort of self-evident in this, in this first one, but um, um, it's, it's going in a certain direction. Because now look at number two. So the second case, going to this, this this uh, typology, and uh, the writer of this in English 
says it's like accusative, but when it says maybe accusative is not the right word, maybe agentive is a better word. And it's the same word karma, uh, that, that go in Japanese, Chinese, ye. Karma uh, is what's defining it, but not, but not karma in the sense of, well, it's closer to the sense of a, a deed or, or an action rather than what karma means in other contexts. Um, I'm just going to step back and, and say something funny because I didn't do my presentation. I once saw a, 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 a sticker on a car driving in the street and it said, your karma just ran over my dog. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? <laughs> okay, forget that. Now let's get serious again. So, uh, so the idea here, I've been saying it a few times, is that this the thing that's put into this category, which we could simply say is accusative, and we think we understand it, what it means, object of some kind of transitive thing, is not necessarily the case. Um, um, you see, there's something in our Chinese said, the case of what is said. And there's another one which says uh, in, the, in number three, instrumental, the case of, of that's a bad translation. Don't look at that number three. It's one is called, <laughs> just some article I found. Um, uh, the first person is that which is spoken of. It means that something can be the object of linguistic presentation, representation. That's the one, that's, that's accusative, even though it has nothing to do with what accusative means in Latin and Greek. Any other one? And the other one is that which one can has a capacity to be expressed. And that doesn't seem to like instrumental at all. But these same two terms are sometimes presented in an opposite order. So that that which can be spoken of is the nominative. And that which has a capacity to be further, to be a subject of discourse means something with uh, uh, an object of a contemplation of thought which can be presented and 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 modified uh, through uh, through linguistic form in terms of these cases. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm gonna watch here. By the way, the, uh, the 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 general term for this use of cases are the eight something, and the word. It's an unusual Chinese character. Usually, uh, the way it's written in these texts, it has nothing to do with the subject at all. It's like the, the, the warbling of a bird. <laughs> <laughs> but because it looks like another word, which means uh, uh, trans turning around or changing. So it, it happens to be I think exactly the same semantics as inflection, even though in 18th century Japan and way back to Tang Dynasty China, they weren't uh, trying to find an equivalent of the of the Western term inflection. Uh, but it's, it's like the same idea. You have the form, and then you have some kind of it's a good English way to say that twisting and turning of it to to to, to produce a new meaning or to modify the meaning. <clears throat> Okay, now um, there's a lot more to say about this, but I'm going to go on to something else. <clears throat> in this 18th century Japanese uh, Chinese, classical Chinese presentation by a Japanese monk of his uh, say profound knowledge of, of Sanskrit grammar, um, there's an there's an appendix written by one of his disciples. Yeah, that, that appendix. Uh, the writer, first of all, makes a, a very strong argument saying all this only matters if it's for the sake of translation. Let's think about that for a minute. Uh, translation actually producing that translated text to, to show people or maybe in your mind translating it. But when he distinguishes between that which is expressed and that which can be expressed. And by that, he seems to mean 
uh, um, things which are subject to presentation in a second language versus which things that, which require interpretive manipulation and, 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 and looking for deeper layers of meaning in order to present it. So in, in this, in this um, addendum, I, I said, what did I call it? Uh, what's the word I use? Mispach. Appendix. Uh, um, uh, he goes on and, and tries to apply this kind of analysis to a number of texts. The original writer, uh, not the disciple, but the original writer, 18th century Japanese writer, uses examples from Buddhist sutras. And I won't go into them because you have to know the sutra. In most cases, I don't. Uh, but this in the appendix, the disciple applies it to very famous lines from the Confucian canon, from the Confucian analects, and looks at very well-known lines and looks at the use of um, you know, function words, in Chinese called empty words, uh, you can call them particles if you like, uh, even that's not a good way to say it. Uh, and, um, and shows that in very many cases, there are alternate readings. It's, it, it, uh, you can take it as, as locative or rockative or, or schmockative or, uh, or, uh, or, or, or accusative. You can, it depends on, it's very much up to the reader and in this case, very much in his view, the translator to decide which case relationship we should is, is operative in a given in a given place. Um, I, I won't I won't go into the examples, but I want to go give you my example. So uh, just maybe this is like a, just a kind of a respite from this dry academic subject, and look at a really wonderful line of Chinese poetry. You get what I'm talking about in just the other line. Of course, I'm not giving you the whole poem, I'm just giving you one, one couplet. Right? One of the most famous Tang poets, Wang Wei, and the title, Guo uh, Shang walking, traveling, going over to a particular temple called the Temple of uh, Accumulated Fragrance. Obviously, you meant Buddhist metaphor. And so the, the, the couplet has is five words, five words. And I'm sure many of you know, in, in especially Tang poetry, and especially what's called regulated verse, especially in what's called the inner couplets of a Tang poem, it's it, it, they're in parallel couplets where the degree of parallelism, I would say, unknown in any other language. Yes, there's parallelism in. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Bible. That's where the English word parallelism comes, comes from, from biblical studies. But uh, you can't do it in other languages to the extent you can do it in Chinese because since every word is a, a syllable, you can line them up, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, often five or seven word lines, and match one to one, one to one, one to one. And then think of the relationship between these things, both in terms of grammatical category, in terms of semantics, in terms of all kinds of angles of analysis. And that gives the whole, uh, opens the door to all of the uh, riches and depth of, of, of the great Chinese poets. So look at this, uh, in just a bold word for word uh, translation, you'll see it there. So the first line is, Chen Shong Yan Wei Shi. So those are the five translations of each word. Now think of this in terms of, of syntax, but syntax based upon the underlying conception of case uh, or other, 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 other linguistic aspects of which we just intuitively or, or just um, unthinkingly have in mind when we, when we try to put it into a syntax. So just look at that first line, it seems most, Natural and obvious, you just take it as a simple, a simple declarative sentence. The sound of the brook swallows up the, uh, some kind of overhanging rocks. Very easy. Noun, verb, object, subject, verb, object. 
uh, there's also the question of, of samasa here because of the sound of the brook or is, uh, is that you can always take a, a, a two noun compound as A and B or A of B in a very simple sense, but not necessarily. Uh, but let's just do it the easy way. So the sound of the, the gurgling sound of the water in the brook is somehow doing something we can call swallowing, maybe like muffling the sound or uh, covering up that, uh, the word for that. Uh, the impression, the visual impression, the sound is somehow muffling uh, the visual impression of these rocks. But then, but obviously, well, let me go to the second line and then come back to what I want to say. And then the second one, where every word matches every word here in, in kind of contrast of pair, the brook, the sun, the sun, sound, sight, visual impression, sight, uh, verb, verb, even though what, why is core cool verb we'll think about. Uh, and then a two-word compound, adjective, noun, adjective, noun. Okay, it seems so simple. Um, but now let's go back to the first line and, and come to the second line, the first line. Who's to say that that simple, straightforward, declarative syntax is correct? There's so many other possibilities. First of all, um, in the absence of case markers, telling you exactly what's a subject, uh, you know, nominative and accusative. Who's to say that the sound of the brook is doing that, is the agent doing the act, uh, performing the act with respect to the object, these three rocks. Now you can, the easiest the next step would be to say, oh, it's not active, it's passive. But then that changes the whole picture. So the sound of the brook is somehow being swallowed up by the rocks. Can you imagine a conception in which that works? The sound is swallowed up by the visual thing, maybe overpowered by, overwhelmed by, uh, locked out of your consciousness by, something like that. Okay, but then there's other possibilities. Uh, you, can, you can make it locative. You can say the, the sound of the book is doing this act among, in this place, among these rocks. Or you can say instrumental by virtue of these rocks or ablative if you want. Uh, and it's all open to interpretation. And that's part of the whole beauty of this kind of manipulation of parallelism, which is, which is a great aspect of Chinese poetry, often Chinese prose too. <clears throat> um, but okay, let's leave that and go to the second line. So now the sound of the of the flowing water and the visual sight of the sun, maybe it's actually the orb of the sun or probably sunshine, right? Uh, <clears throat> by the way, the second word, this uh, literally off in common usage, it just means color. The color means the most visible aspect, or one of the most visible aspects of something you you you, you perceive it. Visually, color, but then uh, it's very often a kind of almost a calc on rupa in, in Sanskrit. So it's something visible form, but with all the underlying philosophical implications of it being illusory. Uh, I don't want to read too much of that into this poem, or the poem is about a visit to a Buddhist monastery and has lots of philosophical depth to it. <clears throat> So the visual aspect of the sunshine. Now the next word, cool. It's really a common word in modern Chinese as well, meaning cold or cool. Uh, it's not hard to turn it into a verb. And just because of the parallelism in this position, verb in the first half, so you expect verb in the second half. And to take, make, turn cool into a verb, that's simple. You know, make cool, cool off. Um, um, and then uh, you have a nominal expression, a nominal expression with a noun and a, and, and a modifying adjective. So that would be the object of the, of the verb. The, the light of the sunlight makes the green pines cool. Let's stop for a second. Is that obvious with that? 
what that picture is. The sunlight makes the green pines cooler. If you can use your imagination and come up with something easily. Sorry, I heard like the sound of the air just cooled. Oh, I mean, the air just cooled off by the green pines because it's softened when you're walking in the forest. Like yeah, something like that. And there's, there's a lot of ways to do it. I think there, I think there, there may be also a lot of the relationship. Yeah, like okay. Like uh, uh, sound in what follows or yeah. getting cool in. Exactly, that's follows. exactly where I want to go with this. You can think of it in terms of unstated, unmarked case relationships. Yeah. This is what I'm using this example to, to demonstrate. So let's just play, let's play a little bit more with the, the meaning of the, of the line, poetic line. What if you turn it into a passive verb, which is also unmarked in Chinese? You just have to do it this way or that way. Can you make simply make the green pines the subject? Yeah, so well, if you turn the verb into passive, cool, then you're doing that. Sun. Yeah. And what would that mean in your in your mental picture? Well, the the sun is nice and cool when you're in the shade of the green pines. Okay, it could be that. Or it could be just a, uh, an aspect of a kind of a optical illusion or a visual, visual impression. Just seeing this bright, shiny stuff and that darker image leads to a kind of cool thing, whatever that means of the impression. Okay, and another ways too. But then let's go. So now, the reason I, I do this is because the idea of implicit, unstated, and especially unmarked what cases is stretching the word, but what case the case means uh, some way of expressing relationship between the elements in syntax. Uh, yes, and it can be unstated and unmarked. Now that leaves me. Anyone want to say anything more about this poem? Or? Is there any way to parse it so that there is a cool preference? Is there any way to parse it so that appearance and cool would be a unit of semantic meaning? No. No. no I, I, appearance is a bad way to say it. I just didn't want to say the look or the sight of it because, or the sunshine would make it too, too specific. I mean, appearance and, cool, and sun have to form but one kind of one unit, but a double unit, which is a samasi. <laughs> because of the parallelism, so if you take it as she just said it, which I think is really nice, the green pines cool the appearance of the sun, then does the subject of the first line also have to be the precarious rocks? Or can you have the subject be the, the and once the you first? exercise your creative reading and decide this goes this way, this goes that way, do they have to be consistent? Yeah, so does the parallelism determine how you have to take? The answer is the very clear, precise answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, now where are we going to go? On? Where are we going to go from here? And here I want to uh, have a little more time. You're not going to give us the answer. <laughs> <laughs> to what question? What is it, what is it? And what does it mean? Yeah. I thought you were going to either say what she was saying or say that no, what she was saying was not right and tell us what the first line actually meant. You're going to leave us hanging forever. Well, I'm going to answer that question with an excursus. Uh, when I was studying Chinese poetry as a student with an extremely erudite, brilliant teacher who uh, Liu Ai also studied with, his name, he's not known to anyone, his name is Gao Yogong. He wasn't famous, but he was brilliant. Um, he forced all of his graduate students to memorize one line from Roman Jakobson. And that line, do you remember, were you forced to memorize it? I don't remember the line. You mean the method from the Ptolemy line? Not that, no. Here's the line in English. He probably wrote it in, in German or Russian. In the poetic function, the principle of equivalence shifts from the axis of selection to the axis of combination. You all know that by heart? Yeah, well, 
don't think I could quote it. But <laughs> Meaning, uh, in every take one of those five word things, in every one every position of the five of the five words in each line, you can have an adjective, a noun, or a certain more restrictive uh, pools of words you can choose from, which will fit into that slot. Right, that's access of selection. That's normal speech. The man, the man bit the dog, uh, dog bit the man, those kind of things you choose what to put there. But the syntax still works. Uh, that's in, but in, in, in poetry, the principle of equivalence shifts to the horizontal line, meaning brook, sound, swallow, precarious rocks linked together with a kind of semantic unity. I have to wrap your mind around that, but you can sort of see. Uh, anyway, I'm not presenting lecture. I'm just telling you what what we were told in, 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 in graduate school. Uh, there's a kind of principle of expression which makes the words going running through the line work together to produce the, the, the meaning of it, separate from the meaning of each word that you can see you can stick in the slot through selection. So that means the meaning of the line is uh, <clears throat> the way in which the book swallows the, the rocks or, or, or vice versa or, or the passive or, you know, or some other way. That's the meaning of it. <clears throat> so I'm not saying I know for a fact what this means, but I always I will just tell you what I yeah, always yeah, thought. Yeah. <clears throat> I always thought the, the reason why this couplet is so famous is, is the element of surprise. Because you don't expect the son, the son of the sun to actually include the green cross. Mm. So if you accept that, then the first line also has to have an element of surprise. Which means that the, the sound of the spring should be a gurgling sound. But now this sound has disappeared as if as if, as if it's a kind of weeping or swallow yeah. around the rock. Because that same Chinese character can mean sobbing. Right, right. So, the, the, <coughs> so you have two moments of transformation. A sound which should be very audible has become a silent sob or an echo swallowing among these very craggy rocks. And the light of the sun, which should otherwise have warmed you, is now cold. So it fits into this whole idea of this journey to the temple and coming to some moment. So the reason I, I I gave I brought I'm giving you this this example is to raise some questions which I hope we can discuss a little bit. Uh, either uh, do I have to end by twelve? Or? Um, yeah. As I started. No, you 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 leave some time for for. Yeah, I mean the whole session. No, the whole session. Let's let's uh, end it around twelve twenty. Okay. Okay. Then then good. So we'll have time because I'm going to raise some questions, which I hope we can get some discussion out of. It. <laughs> so back to this idea of the, the grammar of classical Chinese, or just general questions about grammar, which apply to uh, many, all these different languages. Uh, well, just look at this example, though. Uh, the, the first two readings which strike your mind are taking the verbs as active or passive. I think when it's passive, it just means switching subject to an object. But, uh, and the, the first aspect of that question is, uh, to what extent does it matter if, if, if it's expressed in active or passive voice? Uh, are these just uh, stylistic Phillips, little, little, little twists and tricks, which uh, stylistic things, or does it really go deeper into the essential relationships of the grammar is, is somehow encapsulated. Uh, that, uh, now that's about that's about uh, passive uh, active passive in this first example. But what about the whole idea of marked or unmarked case relationships? Does it matter? Does it matter <coughs> if if case uh, as a concept is embodied in the word itself through inflection? Or sometimes infixes or other ways of doing it, as opposed to just simply having a pre uh, preposition. 
or a postposition? Does it matter? Different languages do it different ways. When you first look at this Chinese, this Chinese text giving you the eight Sanskrit cases, and in each case, you just take an extra little word and stick it around and say, oh, that's the case. Uh, and it seems like, oh, that's just a little uh, trick of apologetics. Uh, but no, so many languages do that anyway. Uh, does, it, does it change anything about the essential meaning of what grammar is governing and, and, and expressing? That's, that's, that's one question. <clears throat> um, because some cases, uh, some, some examples, in that case, some instances of, of, of case systems in, in languages that I don't know uh, have nothing to do with the, uh, the, the categories we have in Latin and Greek and Sanskrit. But, uh, you know, there's a case ending for uh, near the big tree and far from the big tree, or facing north and facing south. Or sometimes there's just two cases, uh, the basic root case and oblique is another case. Thing. And somebody, somebody knows some lines where that really happens. I, I've read about things that I can't really tell you about. <laughs> or uh, other things you can't even imagine. Uh, but in all, these, in all these examples, case means something like I've said a couple of times, uh, some way of encoding the relationship between uh, substantive terms and what they are made to mean in, in the syntactic, in the, in the, in the, in the syntactic uh, develop, uh, exposition of it. <clears throat> <clears throat> and well, the, the, another question is, the, is, is this all just intuitive and the, uh, and the uh, visible presentation of it is just an extra little feature for convenience or for slightly greater precision and is really basically intuitive or governed by the way a given language presents it? I have an example in my mind. Um, a caveman comes back to his cave after been away for a couple of days hunting. Okay, and this is a caveman uh, at a certain period of human evolution where they could they had grunts which could be distinguished for na names of names of things, the basic words. And his grunt says, "Mammoth kill." Wow. And how do you know if it's uh, the mammoth killed all my friends, or, or we killed the mammoth. You know from context, from the look on his face, from how bloody his, uh, he is. If the friends are there or not. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say the recipients of his speech act get it. They get the case, or the, they get the syntactic relationship based on context, of course, but they get it. So the question, here my question is more general. To what extent are these things really necessary in language function? Were they just little added things? Uh, the very fact that so many languages had more elaborate case systems and lost them because they were felt to be unnecessary or, or for other reasons of, Political or social authority, I don't know. Uh, you know, English and French, and uh, I think we know Middle English had a lot more, and uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, even Chinese, which, uh, have you heard about this? Uh, vestiges of case endings in Chinese? For example, in the uh, personal pronoun, wu or who is always nominative and war is always a bleak case. Not always, but generally in classical frames. I won't be able to explain that. I mean, you sort of know. Yeah, but, but so people say that's a vestige of originally the word case endings in the, in the, in the, in the pronominal, in the pronoun term. Even for you, uh, 
uh, Fresco, you don't use me very much in Fresco, but that's more, more like an oblique or a fusory. Uh, but raw, raw in these things. And actually the sound of r and n come together in Japanese, which somehow preserves, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, it's shuoni in the little child. So what would be er in Chinese becomes ni in that Japanese. Um, where am I going with this? So even Chinese is some kind of vestigial things which seem to indicate there were more case, uh, it was a kind of, there were case markers at some point. And the people who, we, we, scholars, uh, we, uh, today who, who um, specialize in, arch in re reconstructing archaic Chinese and often give us these Chinese syllables, often with a string of consonants before the, 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 the vowel. And it sometimes looks very funny. It looks like Tibetan, like Z, B, G, and then a vowel, and blah, 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 blah. And they argue that each one of these little extra consonants in front are, are case markers. Have you seen that? I probably wouldn't be able to understand it. Yeah, I can't understand it either. But I'm saying that the idea that Chinese may have had it earlier probably did, at least from this one example I just gave you. Uh, and so many other examples, uh, you know, English, French, German, the way Mon and Greek shared so much of the, uh, of the uh, radical structure uh, ends up in, uh, that was what was retained. Uh, Arabic. Uh, all you have is this, you know, what's called new nation or tanin, this some kind of n sound with three different vowels for three different cases, whether that comes from uh, or another aspect of that is whether sometimes what we think are case endings embedded in, in embedded at, as an inflection of the word itself may have originally been separate words. Uh, we somehow get Packed on, you become like an enclitics. For example, uh, <clears throat> uh, in Romania, there's a there's a the, the definite article in masculine but not in feminine is is made postposition. As is in Aramaic, by the way, those of you know. Uh, <clears throat> and and um, it takes the form of ul. So I'm going to give you a word that, even if you're not Romanian, you know this word. Dracule. Drac is a yeah, devil. Ul is a de definite is a def is a definite article. And it is what makes the vacater out of it. You know, it's not really vacater in most cases. Uh, and they say that ul is not just a inflectional ending. It's ilul in Latin. That's they claim. But uh, that example may not convince you, but the fact that sometimes, I think I've seen other people claim that even in, in, Latin, in Latin and Greek, some of these things can be thought of as originally being separate words, which somehow get in, engulfed into the word itself. Look, we know this. This is yeah. a, a recognized <laughs> linguistic process yeah. that you can build up a case system by adding things that were originally separate words. The, okay. the concept is a, is a wholly unproblematic one. Okay, I'm glad you said that. So, uh, so my question once again comes back to, uh, does that mean case is, is just a, a decorative aspect and doesn't add that much precision? It, it's usually in any given utterance in an actual speech, speech act, uh, it's usually uh, doesn't need to be made more precise. It's usually uh, intuitively obvious. <clears throat> and for example, in Chinese, when you don't have the, these, you have these unmarked sort of case relationships, uh, if you need to be more precise, more precise, no problem. If you need, Chinese doesn't have a, a gender and number, fine. But if you want, if, well, gender is easy, but if you want, uh, if you want to specify number, it's plural instead of instead of singular. You specify it with a number or some other word. And Chinese doesn't have tense. If, if you want to specify a particular, in most cases you don't need it. As in much uneducated or even educated spoken language in the world, 
<clears throat> often the precise markers are mixed up or messed up or ignored. Think of think of uneducated American speech. Can we bring this to the yeah, discussion yeah. part? Okay. You know, Abby, Abby go, Abby go home. You know, they, they, it's just, you know exactly what it is. You don't need the markers. So that's the question. What is the function of, <clears throat> of marked grammatical categories? In this case, case, in this case, case, cases. Now, just one more question I want to raise is uh, um, a few of our papers uh, this morning and Truman and, and almost everybody else have tried to at least suggest the connection between the system of grammatical conceptions and deeper philosophical implications, whether it's religious, uh, cosmic, um, and that seems to be a very broad phenomenon in, 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 in many of these classical languages. <clears throat> um, but that hinges on the whole question of whether um, we think of grammar as an intrinsic, uh, meaningful, embedded structure in reality, which can be represented in speech patterns, uh, but really is reflecting the ultimate reality of existence or, or the cosmos or the earth or human affairs or whatever, uh, as opposed to a, uh, a more or less, and then and I think, well, I'll say the word, an arbitrarily imposed system, uh, often unnecessary in, uh, in the presentation of human, in, in the enactment of human communication. I was not going to say, but my time is run out, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, okay, I'll, uh, we have a we have a short uh, short time for conversation. The person behind you was first up. Okay, please. Has your question changed about whether it's consenting the decorative and unnecessary when you're talking about spoken word versus written speech? It seems to me in in written speech, casings are not decorative and are much more necessary because you don't have the context of you know if there's blood on someone's face or the tone of voice they said it in. I'm thinking of the example of like the bear eats sheep and leaves. Uh, if you see that written without commas and you don't see you know the situation, that's very different from if a person runs into a room and says the bear you know did the terrible thing. So it case endings maybe are of different importance in writing versus spoken word. But uh, writing includes poetry, and and poets love to. Uh, create ambiguities, and uh, so you can do it. You don't need it in writing any more than. Matter of fact, spoken languages often tend to be uh, have, have more uh, linguistic markers. Modern Chinese, for example, as opposed to classical Chinese, there's a lot more ways to be more precise about number and tense and all of that. <laughs> we we have a linguist in the crowd. I think we should give them a chance to say. Um, so the question is whether this point is necessary for the category issue. There Speak up, very kind. Yeah. The question is whether the first thing is required to establish for mark grammatical relations is the critical one. Because typically, languages will either have some kind of case marking, and indeed, uh, there's no good principal distinction between what we call case markers and prepositions or prepositions. The first thing is to be an individual language. The other one is um, agreement. So languages in which agreement often uh, don't have case. And the third is uh, mm -hmm. agreement. So uh, marking the arguments in somewhere on the work. And the third is word order. So typically languages on the first uh, order and word is to establish grammatical relations. So if anybody has uh, how languages come to acquire one type of marking as opposed to another. I mean, if not, if none of this is a mystery. That's what I mean. Yeah. Let me respond to uh, the personal thing. During the uh, pandemic years, I've been uh, reading Latin poetry with a, with a friend of mine. He's actually a, a scholar of Arabic poetry, but he's, he's, he's a, 
interpret the language pattern. And he had a good classical education in his native Hungary. And he, he knows Latin a thousand times better than I do. Um, but we, we're going through, we went through all, all, of, all the Aeneid and now we're doing Hollows and we're doing a lot of these things. And there are often passages in which, first of all, Latin poetry, as you all know, word order is just <laughs> so uh, tangled up into the, and that part of the reading of it. I don't know if the original recipients of it would mentally do that and just feel it. But for us people reading it, you have to unpack it. You have to try to figure out what is the real order or the word order that's, that's hidden in there. And sometimes it's marked by the case endings. And some, you might think this is impossible, but sometimes you're not sure what case it is. Uh, or especially when, when, because of meter, words are shortened and, uh, and you don't get the full, the full endings. Uh, even in Latin poetry, sometimes it's not, it's not, it's not obvious. Let me just add one point I should have said, said earlier. Even when you have clear case system, like in, like, like in Latin, but it doesn't mean you, you dispense with the prepositions in many cases. You, you can have cases without prepositions. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to like have both, but you can have just one yeah. without the other. So there, there is a parallel in Latin for the kind of um, translation of grammatical categories you were describing, um, because Latin grammar arises in a similar bilingual situation mm -hmm. where Roman grammarians, uh, Greek grammar was invented first, and Roman grammarians often mm -hmm. take the, the concepts and as well as specific words, so they're loan words taken from, from Greek to describe Latin. Um, and sometimes Romans take concepts for things that exist only in Greek, and they apply it or misapply it to Latin. So an example of this is, is, is the optative. Um, there's an optative mood in the Greek verb, which is expressed morphologically. Um, the, there's no morphological category in Latin, but the, the, the Latin grammarians say, well, the optative uh, is a statement that expresses a wish, and it's, it's a sort of semantic category, or it's, yeah, it's a semantic category. And also the dual, the dual number exists archaically in Greek. There's no dual in Latin for the most part, but they say there's a, a Latin dual. Um, and my way of understanding this, I'm not sure if it's right, is, is that these Roman grammarians have mistaken a description of a particular language, Greek, and they've imagined that's a kind of abstract description of language right. in general. Right. Yeah. Um, or that Greek is in some sense the ideal language or that these categories are, are sort of deep descriptions of how language should work. Does that, does that match? Uh, can, I, can, I jump, can I jump yeah. in for a second? I, I, think, I think this is the direction we should be going in our conversation. That is to say, the specific linguistic questions are not particularly uh, of interest to us, both because they're not so complicated and because they're so detailed. Whereas the general question seems to be attention within what we call grammar between two axes. One is the particularistic description of a given language, which is a species of speech, you know, with its particularities and liberties and so on. And another is a more abstract attempt to understand the world, okay? <laughs> the logical relationships, semantic relationships, and, and so on in a way that is always a little bit determined by that specific language, but tries to liberate itself and to become more abstract and universal in general, okay? And when these two, when systems between languages meet, like Greek and Latin, or like the, the, the fact that we stupidly apply the Latin terms yeah. to Sanskrit uh, terminology, or like the attempts that were done here with applying the Sanskrit uh, concepts to Chinese language, when the, the, the tension between these two axes becomes more apparent and we get very interesting, we get very interesting phenomena coming out. Uh, again, not interesting because of linguistic specific questions, but because of these tensions. What's interesting about the Sanskrit system is the way it tried to do both ends, right? The Karaka theory, 
is a theory about supposedly not related to language. Of course, it's related to the language that they had in front of them. But, you know, in theory, it's a universal truth. You can cook in a kitchen yeah. using some utensils, and there is a cook, and there is something that is being cooked. And so these are notional relations that have nothing to do with the specific morphological relationships. And there are, you know, the, the specific one through seven, uh, one first, first vibhakti, second vibhakti, third vibhakti, you know, cases, okay, which have a morphological. So, and then Sanskrit tries to match them as per sentence. It's active, it's uh, passive, it's, it uses these cases. Sometimes uh, another, sometimes a case number four, as a case number six usually is used for one of the other cases and so on. Uh, but, but it is in the, it's when these different ways of looking at different languages and trying to to superimpose one system or, or another, when you have these meetings, that's when these tensions come to the fore and, and, they're, and they're very interesting. I think we should be talking about these, these tensions. Can I just say something you said yeah. and, and, then, and then we'll go to that. Uh, perhaps I totally agree with what you said. That's exactly what I'm trying to uh, suggest here. Uh, you mentioned up to there. You know, in uh, classical Arabic and, class and biblical Hebrew, we have these categories which are, which are used to explain certain forms. Uh, I think that's a perfect example of, of my statement that often these things are totally unnecessary. You just this whole door of yours for uh, or just for more stylistic additions. For example, subjunctive. Subjunctive is never really helps you very much. You always get the subjunctive feeling. It's called the mood, right? You always get the mood anyway from, from phrases that are used, would that wish that blah blah blah. Uh, you don't need subjunctive morphology. And that's why it's dropped so often in, 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 in later versions, later, later stages of language. That's why, for example, I, I know I don't know if people agree with me. Uh, French speakers often don't worry too much about, about using subjunctive in, in speech. The Italians do. So uh, it's, uh, it means it's more arbitrary, is what I'm saying, and also awesome. unnecessary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I can add something about this, this last <laughs> about Italian. You know, uh, many Italians, perhaps a house of Italians, don't use subjunctive. I don't use it because my my dialect doesn't have the subjunctive. A conditional, yes. Conditional, yes, yes. Whereas you don't need to say conditional, you need, we, but you but, but you do use it. I, conditional, I do use it, but uh, about subjunctive, uh, I must be very attentive to subjunctive when I speak formal Italian, like at conferences or with my students, because I don't use it in my dialect. In the Italian I, spoke at home, I speak at home, and there is actually no need to, it, to use subjunctive. So the perspective changes everything. Yeah, that's the point. I just want to go back to the case of Kiwi for a moment. It's really important. I think with, with, it's a very practical matter, because how do you learn classical Chinese? You, you, you memorize enough, and at some point you, you can reproduce it. Okay, maybe not at a very high level, but you, you can reproduce it. In, in fact, in order to write modern Chinese <coughs> and give the impression of being somewhat educated, you do have to throw in a lot of classical sentence breaking. Right? So, so because that's the case, it's very hard to. That's why I said that it's not talk about grammar because it was never explained in grammatical terms. That this, this is how. You take a sentence apart and this is how you understand the meaning of it. Because you just memorize a lot of it. So so much so that when I learned English, I thought the way to learn it is just to memorize passages. I, I didn't really understand the concept of grammar very well. So I, it seems to me that a lot of it is practical and pedagogical. It's not how you teach a language and how you learn a language. Right? Yeah, with regard to functionality or dysfunctionality of case marking, 
I think we should not lose sight of uh, certain facts. One is uh, the correlation between free word order and the modeling of K, both synchronically and diachronically. So, uh, so it's not simply uh, dropping dropping case yeah. marking because of our decorative purposes. Uh, it, it, there is a trade-off between morphology and syntax you know, that we should not lose sight of. And then from the communication point of view, it is true that uh, the case markings are dropped uh, in poetry, in classical poetry. And this is very much true of Tamil classical uh, poetry, where many nouns and marks for, uh, for cases. But uh, the purpose of poetic communication is to communicate ambiguity. So uh, that is quite different from the purpose of communication in the ordinary language. So it has a function of course, why we use or we don't use the case markers. Uh, these are relevant for talking about whether case marking is decorative or not. And then I have a question about your paper in general. Uh, incidentally, in my paper later, I also talk about how Tamil reacted to Samaja and Karaka in, in, in their um, grammar. So my and question is, you, you were, uh, your paper presented how Chinese grammarians gave illustrations about uh, the concept of Samaja and Karaka. But Samaja and Karaga both are controversial issues, and then they have been debated over centuries in Sanskrit as well as in Thomas. Uh, so whether Ch Chinese grammarians uh, talked about this controversy and took one position over the other, or they simply took one position from Sanskrit and applied to Sanskrit and Chinese. So the answer is no, they didn't debate the things that you would call grammar. They did debate literary style. The, 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 common, the most common term for grammar in Chinese is one fa, this means rules or mode, proper mode of writing. Uh, actually, the, the modern Chinese term probably was taken from Japanese who invented it based on Chinese sources anyway. So it's, it's... I actually tried to look it up last night. It, it, it wasn't so many people accepted it. Well, they would say one but they didn't mean anything like what you like around no, it. They no. meant just we have a way of writing. Modes of composition or stylistics or. or... Yeah, one controversy about Samaja is uh, uh, what compound is, whether it is a dropping of morphological uh, marking so that uh, uh, it becomes a compound, or the important thing is the semantic integrity of, of the two things. Mm -hmm. And this is a long controversy. Finally, um, most people agree with, with the fact, with, with the theory that uh, the semantic unity is crucial, and then dropping of uh, morphological marking is operational details. Um, details of that. Mm -hmm. This happened in Tamara and this happened in Sanskrit. I don't know whether any such debates uh, in Chinese contributed to resolve this, uh, con um, this uh, theoretical debates about whether compound or no, no debates. But I like to respond with one, one quick thing. Um, you know, in Hebrew, when you have something in smichut, and then you go to translate that into another language, uh, or it goes in the other direction also. Very often there's an ambiguity whether, whether it's, it, we have to say X of Y or the Y X. And very often in English, for example, it makes a real difference semantically. Right. Uh, because if you just have a smichut in Hebrew, you don't, you just let it, let it stand. You don't have to determine that because, because it's on, you don't have to stick in a marker. Of course, in spoken Hebrew, you do stick in X, Y, and you have to you, you try and make it make more sense. <clears throat> I think uh, uh, I don't want to let's have lunch become an optative. <laughs> let's just have lunch and uh, uh, resume. Subjunctive, you wish we had. <laughs> <laughs>